And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good, and all the time, Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I am delighted to be with you on this holy day. I really enjoyed myself with you last night, and I told my wife how much I enjoyed myself, I told my friends who wrote me, and I also put it on Twitter, how I am enjoying myself with God's distinguished youth at Blue Mountain Academy. Did you sleep well? Did you pray before you slept? Did you pray first thing this morning? The amens went down. I gave you a quotation last night. Do you remember what it was? Your last thought at night, your first thought in the morning, should be of him in whom is centered your hope of eternal life. Our High Calling, page 116, paragraph 2. Thanks for coming. It is now 10 minutes to 12. I'll release you before or just about 12.30. If that's satisfactory, say Amen. I read somewhere where Eloise said preachers should cut their sermons in half. And I always say she wrote that because she saw me in vision. And so I will try to cut it short without undoing what the Holy Ghost desires to do through the Word. Our subject for this morning, children should not be childish. What did I say? This side, what was our subject last night? That side, are they right? Yes. yes. And what was priority one? Yes. Character development. Is there an age group for hell? No. Is there an age group for heaven? No. no. Heaven is for all those who obey. Hell is for all those who rebel. It is as simple as that. When God spake the Ten Commandments, he spoke them to what age group? All people. When the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, tells us this is the whole duty of man, he meant this is the whole duty of all human beings regardless of age because God does not have 
two standards. He has one, the Ten Commandments. And so our subject is children should not be childish. Since you don't carry phones, there's no need for me to ask you to turn them off. Thank you for that. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I'm not sure whether I should ask you if anyone offered that prayer for me last night. Did anyone do that? Amen. Who? Oh, God bless you. I mean that. God bless you. When I say God bless you, I'm offering a prayer with my eyes open, made up of three words. God bless you. I can change my phraseology. Father, bless them. I need those prayers. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. God's hand is divine. My mouth is dirt. We have this treasure where? In earthen vessels. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And God knows I desire to speak his words. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together. Why are your grades falling? Think. Why is it nobody likes you? Think. Reason. I love that about God. He is willing to come down and reason with us and listen to us. Your parents may not listen because they're busy. God will listen. I need more amens than that. God will listen to you. Regardless of how large or how microscopic your concern may be. Let's bow our heads now as we pray. Dear God, I've come to you because I have nowhere else to go to get help. I am earthy, I am dirt, I am clay. Yet you've sent me to proclaim a divine message. Father, please feel the responsibility to help me. Possess my mind, possess my memory, possess my mouth, possess all of me, so that literally, God, it will be you speaking from this desk. If I've offended you, dear God, in your vast immeasurable mercy, forgive me and place in my heart an intense hatred for sin. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice in this building and online, particularly the youth. Now, Father, Wherever your people are worshiping you on this holy day, bless them similarly, I pray. Thank you for the high honor of speaking for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. The book of Romans, written by whom? The Apostle Paul. Romans 5, we read verse 6. Who has it? Good, good, good. God needs quick people. If you have my version, you may read with me. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, finish the verse, Christ died for the ungodly. What did Christ do? He died. Go to verse 8. Read with me. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, what? When we were sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than being justified by his what? Means his death. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Read verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, we have death in verse 6. We have death in verse 8. We have death in verse 9. We have death in verse 10. Christ came to die. For sinners. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read verse 3. Our subject, children should not be childish. And I welcome those of you online, wherever you are. 
God be praised for the modern technology that permits someone to stand in Hamburg and be heard in Kenya or Germany or wherever. We thank God for that. But keep in mind, young people, technology has a dark side. Be careful how you use it. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ did what? Die for our sins according to the Scripture. We've read that Christ came to die for us. Now, question for you. Could Christ have come on a Friday morning as a man, die on a cross Friday afternoon, go to the grave, come up Sunday morning, spend some days with the disciples, and go on back? Could he have come, die, and go right back? Yes or no? Yes. Why did he have to come in a woman's womb? Why spend 30-something years on earth before the actual discrete event of his death? It doesn't take that long to die. I'll quiz you now. Christ not only came to die, but before his death he came to live. He came to live the life as an example to those for whom he came to die. I didn't say that clearly. Let me try again. Christ came not simply to die. He came to live, to show us how to live. From the womb. Question for you. Was Christ 12 years old? Yes or no? Was he 14? Was he 17? Do we have 17 year olds among us now? Yes. Are you wondering how to live? Study the life of Christ. But some clever person may say, well, the Bible tells us nothing about Christ from the age of 12 until 30 when he began his public ministry. That's not true. What's the third favor I ask of you? Think. Let's do that. Go to Romans, not Romans, John 8. Let's look at the life of Christ between 12 and 30. John 8. Ah, God bless you. <laughs> In these last days, we need people who can move fast. Verse 29 of John 8. When you found it, say amen. amen. Has anyone prayed for me yet? You, you really did? Ah, oh, God bless you. Let's read verse 29 together. And he that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Finish the verse. For I do, come on, always what? Those things, come on, that please him. Now, what does always mean? Now, we have no explicit information about Christ between 12 and 30. But does always include when he was 17, 18, 13, 27? Yes. So we have some idea of how Jesus lived as a 17-year-old. And what was that lifestyle? He did always those things that please God. Question for you. Don't answer me. Is that what you do? Christ, go to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. It's 12 o'clock on the dot. When did I say I'll release you? Did I really say that? All right. What book did I say? What chapter? What other book did Luke write? Acts, yes. What was Luke's profession? He was a doctor. He was also a historian. And modern historians studying Luke and Acts have concluded that Luke was one of the finest ancient or modern historian. 
the persons, places, and dates that he mentions in his two books can all be verified. Luke, you see, being a Christian does not justify being sloppy. Is this microphone working? <laughs> Let me say differently. Excellence is Christian behavior. Amen. Mm -hmm, I like that guy. <laughs> Excellence is Christian behavior. Somebody on this side, say amen. amen. Say it more loudly on this side. Mm -hmm. Excellence is a lifestyle. It's a mindset. And Luke was excellent now. Luke chapter 2 from verse 46, read with me. And it came to pass, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that saw him or heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. Now, but when they saw him, they were, amazed. they were astonished at his understanding and answers. But when they saw him, they were amazed as his mother and father. And his mother said unto him, verse 48, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Thy father and I have sought thee. How? Sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? How old was he? Is that an example for us? At what age? At what age? At what age? Mm -mm. At what age? When should you be about your father's business? At any age. Ah, don't let me down. The internet is listening to you. At what age should you be about your father's business? Any age. On this particular occasion, Christ was 12. Now, do we have 12-year-olds at Blue Mountain Academy? Yes or no? No. Too young. Okay. If Christ can be about his father's business at 12, what am I about to say? <laughs> Can't you be about your father's business? Say yes. yes. Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. Christ came to this earth <coughs> to show us how to live. From infancy to adulthood, or as I heard one person say, from the womb to the tomb. Listen to what Ella White has to say about Timothy. The book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, page 2 or 3, paragraph 3. What did I say? Acts of the Apostles, page 2 or 3, paragraph 3. Listen carefully. Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, please tighten your grip on me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Timothy was a mere youth when he was chosen by God to be a teacher. What is a youth? Is a 22-year-old man a youth? No. Are there any youth present now? Yes. Yes. Timothy was a mere youth when God chose him to be a teacher. But his principles had been so established by his early education that he was fitted to take his place as Paul's assistant. Now, wait a minute. If Mark Finley came to you and said, I want you to be the assistant evangelist, you would probably say, but I'm only 16. That's what Timothy was when he was called by God and chosen by Paul. What am I saying? Youth is no excuse for irresponsibility. There is more to youth than skateboarding. Hmm? And uh, video games. And gaming. There is more to youth than that. Why? This world is coming to an end. And God needs an army of old and young to prepare the world for what's coming on this earth. And it's coming soon. And so Jesus Christ came to live, to show us how to live. 
And the example of Jesus Christ is for all age groups. What Christ accomplished in his life, in his humanity, you and I can accomplish. That amen sounds as if you had no breakfast. <laughs> what Christ accomplished in his humanity, you and I can accomplish. Let me shock you a little bit. But first, I'll ask you this. Should adults, I'm asking this side, should adults set examples for the youth? Yes. yes. Should the youth set example for adults? Yes. Yes. And the Bible says that. You may be shocked. The Bible calls upon the youth to set an example for the elderly. But before I dive into that, Listen to what the Bible says. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God made Adam, God made Eve. Now in verse 21 of Genesis 2, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, God made a man and so he made two, two, yes, but two, <laughs> let me put it this way, think with me, did God make a boy and a girl? Did God, make, did God make a boy and a girl? What did he make? A man and a woman. So he made two? Ah, God bless you. I lost weight trying to get that out of you. He made two adults. A man. By the way, when God put Adam and Eve together romantically, he put two adults together. So get rid of that boyfriend you have. <laughs> Too young. Are you with me? Get some good grades. Are you following me? All right. Now stop fainting. Focus. Stop focus. Focus. God made two adults. Now, everyone else comes into the world how? As a baby. Which means God arranged for babies to be influenced by adults. So the primary burden is on the adult to exert a wholesome influence on the baby, the toddler, the whatever, preschool, post school, adolescent, pre adolescent, post adolescent, you name it. There's a burden on the adults, the home, the parents, to exert a nourishing influence. But when Christ said, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business, he exerted an influence on his parents. They received an example of what? When Christ said that, they saw an example of what? F A I faithfulness in their child. Don't you believe that when Christ spoke to the doctors who could not answer his questions, he exerted an influence upon them? Now, let's get some biblical authority for what I just said, that you're required to exert an influence on the elderly or those older than you. Are you ready? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It is now 10 after 12. Time flies so quickly. And by the way, if I'm too hard on you, just tell me. Are you with me? Just say, Elder Skeet, can you give us a Mary had a little lamb sermon and I'll try to work things out for you if I'm too hard on you. Are you with me? But you look tough, so I thought I can be tough with you. Was I wrong? Okay. What book did I say? 
What chapter? Chapter 4, reading verse 12. Oh, who said 12? I like that person. Verse 12. Are you there? May I see how many of you who have the King James Version? Can I see your hand? But you don't read. Read with me. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in 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 purity. Mm -hmm. Read that verse again. Be thou an example of the believers in word. Your speech should set an example for those older than you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In word, in conversation. The elderly should be able to say, or the adults, let me stop saying elderly, the adults should say, they are always talking about Jesus. In word, in conversation, what's the next one? In charity. Are you always willing to volunteer to help? In faith, in purity. What's purity? An upright life. And the Bible says, be an example to older people. What's our subject? Children should not be childish. This may sound contradictory. Being a child is no excuse for being childish. I'll let you figure that out. Be thou an example. Paul wrote to a young man, Timothy, who was a teenager when God chose him and Paul recruited him. And Paul tells him, in your youthfulness, set an example for the older members of the church. Now, can a young man run a church, yes or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. And God is looking down on Blue Mountain Academy and he's wondering, which of these young men could serve me as a modern Timothy? Go to Titus, another young man. Titus 2, we read from verse 1. What's our subject? You were a little slow. What's our subject? Mm -hmm. It's okay to be childlike, even when you're an adult, but not childish. Do you have Titus chapter 2? Reading from verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be what? Sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The elder of the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be what? Sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, read what two groups is Paul telling uh, Titus to address? Come on. Look at verse 2. The older men. Look at verse 3. The older women. Now there is a word in verse 3. Do you see the word likewise in verse 3? Do you see likewise? What is its function? To say likewise, you must have a previous example. Are you following me? No, you're not. All right, if I were to say, I'd like you to jump like Michael Jordan. Are you with me? He is the example. You must do likewise. Now, there's a likewise in verse 3. What's the prior example? The aged men. The same way you must charge the aged men to be faithful and, you know, temperate and grave and charity and patience, the same way charge the aged women. Their being behavior has become its holiness. Not false accusers, not given to us why, teachers of good things, the same way you charge the older men, charge the older women. Now, read verse 6. 
nice and loud. Read the King James Version. Young men, likewise, charged to be what? Think. Now, what does likewise mean? The same way, Titus, you charge the older men. The same way you charge the older women. Charge the young men. To be what? Sober-minded. What's the opposite of sober? Drunk. (laughs) Paul tells Titus, you tell these young men, because he himself was a young man, be sober man. Read the first few words of verse 7, those of you in my version. What does that say? Stop. What's the key word there? All. All. (laughs) In all things. Showing thyself what? A pattern of? Mm -hmm. A pattern to whom? What's the first group? ah, Thank you. What's the second group? A pattern to whom? The adults. Clearly those younger too, but the adults. Because you're leading them. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. Now, next verse, what does that say? In doctrine showing what? All? All, you must defend, Paul says, the Sabbath. You must defend the divinity of the Holy Spirit. You must defend the humanity of Jesus Christ and his divinity. You must defend the inerrancy of scripture. Somebody say amen. You must defend the perpetuity of the law of God. I just say, but I'm a young man. Paul said, I don't care. You have the ability. Young man or young woman. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing all uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Read the next verse. Sound speech that what? Cannot be contemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing. Finish the verse. Mm -hmm. In other words, you conduct yourself in such a way, the principal of Blue Mountain Academy cannot find anything negative to say. You conduct yourself in a classroom in such a way that your physics teacher cannot find anything negative to say. Do you know you can determine what people think of you to a certain degree? Are you following me? If you come to class always neatly dressed, even though the teacher doesn't like you, you know what the teacher has to say? I don't like him, but... Come on. I don't like him, but he's always, come on, neatly dressed. Your assignments are always well written, nicely typed, on time. The teacher may say, I don't like her, but her assignments, come on, are always on time. You can, to a certain degree, determine what people think of you. And so Paul tells Titus, and he's telling you because Titus is dead, in all things, Showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing all uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be contemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. Listen to me carefully. I'm your elder brother. And I don't say that lightly. What God expects of you is what you would expect of a young man living actually in heaven now. When Christ rose from the dead, did he take people with him? Yes or no? Yes. And he took them up. We don't know the ages. It may very well be some young men and young women went up. Because in all ages, they have been faithful young men, young women. There's a young man in heaven now. Describe the life he's living. 
Come on. Give me some one word descriptions. What's that? Purposeful, yes. Sinless, yes. Come on. What's that? Eternal life. That's a one word response. Okay, eternal life, yes. There's somebody else. Perfect, somebody else. Holy, responsible, respectful now. Say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come slowly now. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. The same way it's done in heaven. And that is not from revelation. It's not symbolic. Let me give you the quotation I gave you last night. Education, page 15, paragraph 2. What did I say? It's 25 after, or 24 after 12. Here's what it says. To restore in man the image of his maker. To restore in man, the word man there means what? People. What age? Any age. To restore in the young people of Blue Mountain Academy the image of his maker. To promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized, which was to reflect the image of God. This was to be the aim or the purpose of redemption. This is the great object of life, of education, the great object of life. The restoration of the image of God in a sinner, when I say a sinner, a human being who carries the sinful nature. But the sinful nature is not charged against us as a sin. Because Christ took the same nature. What's charged against us are our choices. You all look well-dressed. God bless you for that. Did it happen accidentally? Did you put all your clothes on the ground, jump into them, and stood up, and there you were? You chose the tie. You chose the shirt. You chose the shoe. You chose the blouse. You chose whatever. And God says to you and to me, choose to live like Christ. Choose by your lifestyle to reflect the lifestyle of heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What I'm trying to tell you, the life Christ lived is the life you can live. At your age of 16, 17, and whatever. What's our subject? Children. Children should not be childish. Children can be mature. Have you ever heard of a child being charged in court as an adult? Yes. Let me ask you this. It's rather unpleasant, but I'll ask you. Are there gangs in large cities, yes or no? Yes. Are there young boys in those gangs? Yes. Do they kill? Yes. Now, if you can do adult things on Satan's side and your youth, can you not do adult things on God's side yes. while you, yes. So Satan says, come my side, I will teach you to perform adult crimes. Hijack a car and shoot the person behind the wheel and you're only 14. Jesus says, come, I will teach you to do adult things on my side. Run a church. Teach a Bible class. One clear indication of God's love for you is the high, high standard he has set. When you go home at the end of terms and all your grades are A's, you're very happy. And your parents say, money well spent. When all you have are D's and E's and F's, 
the last place you want to go is home. <laughs> to show your parents who are working two and three jobs, this is what you've done. Because their expectations are high. Because they love you. But they cannot love you as much as your heavenly father loves you. And his expectations are alpine. They are Himalayan. Christ's character. And God has that expectation because he provides the resource to reach it. Listen to Paul. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, the life I live is actually Christ living out his life in me. Galatians 2.20. Jesus said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. On the earth, Christ's power was the indwelling of the Father. Paul's power was the indwelling of Christ. Your power must also be the indwelling of Christ. Amen. Now listen very carefully. The Desire of Ages, page 677, it is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. You get this into you, you've taken Christ into you. In the beginning was the word, Kate with me, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who is that? Verse 14, and the word became flesh. Who became flesh? Jesus Christ. He is the word. Revelation 19, verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. Psalm 138, verse 2, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Get Christ in you. And that 12-year-old Christ, who demonstrated amazing responsibility, who was familiar with what his father required, that same Christ will express that life in you. Amen. This is the medium, the spirit-filled word, this, for which we have so little time. This. Let me tell you another secret. The more you expose your mind to this, the more the divine radiation of God's word will remove your love for the world. It doesn't happen overnight. It will happen. If you go out to the sun, you're light-skinned, you expose, gradually there's a, 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 a darkening of the color. It doesn't happen overnight. You've got to have some sustained exposure. Sustained exposure to the word of God will gradually remove your love. For the things of this world. And so Ella White writes, Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1, if studied and obeyed. The Word of God works in the heart. Subduing. Give me another word for subduing. What? Overcoming, Overcoming every unholy attribute. How many? Every. But what are the conditions if? Come on, if? Studied and obey. And that applies to all ages. God has a standard for you because he loves you. He expects more of you. And he wants you to expect more of yourself. In so doing, you think like him. I didn't say that clearly. Let me try again. God expects more of you. Now, when you expect more of yourself, you're thinking like God. That's the way I want you to think. When Christ comes, I want there to be young people in heaven who say, I am in heaven because of his life. That young man who went to Blue Mountain Academy, let there be no young man in hell who looks on the walls and sees you and says, I am here because of you. How many of you will say, Father, 
help me to strive for the standard you have set for me. Can I see your right hand? Help, stand up with me. Help me to strive for the standard you have set for me. I want to offer a special prayer for you. It's 12.30. May I have five more minutes, please? All right. Special prayer. If there's something you need to overcome, some particular weakness, and you want me to offer a special prayer for you, come quickly, come right here. Something you've been struggling with, you need special prayer, come right here. God knows what it is, no one else needs to know. But the Bible tells you with great comfort, with God, nothing shall be impossible. I don't care what it is. The power of God can give you the victory. There is something I have been struggling with. I need prayer. But my prayer must be combined with your effort through the word of God. Anybody else? There is something I have been struggling with. It weakens me spiritually. I want to be delivered. The Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, Matthew 12, 22. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Christ reversed the man's condition. He can do the same for you. He hasn't changed. Eloi said, He's just as willing now to heal as when he was personally upon the earth. This is of page 823, paragraph 4. Anybody else? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, when you told Abraham he'd have a child, he had some doubts. You said to him, is anything too hard for the Lord? And you're asking us today, gathered before you today, God, our young men, young women, who have quietly admitted they are struggling with something. Father, Adam was thrown out of Eden because he made one mistake. It only takes one struggle, one weakness, to ruin a life, Father. Now, God, approach your sons and daughters individually and begin the work of victory in their lives. Let them not doubt for a second that you can grant them this victory. Whatever it is, the blood of Christ can remove it. They have to believe that and give evidence of that belief by going to the word to study and obey because the tremendous power to overthrow that thing is in the word of God. The same word that said, let there be light. The same word that said, Lazarus come forth. That is the word that will give them the victory. Bless them, dear God. Bless their parents. Bless Blue Mountain Academy. And all those charged with its administration. Bless the Pennsylvania Conference God, the President and all his assistants. Father, let Blue Mountain Academy be the reason why many will be ready to meet Christ when he comes and he is coming. Until that great day, keep these young men and these young women faithful. Let each be a blessing to the other. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Can we sing to close? You may return to your seats. God bless you. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Hymn two, unless there's some other musical arrangement. Is there? There is. All right. 286 is fine? All right. 286, closing hymn. Happy Sabbath again, church. Can we give another amen to Pastor Randy Skeet, please? Amen. For our final hymn, please stand as we sing wonderful words of life.
before we get to the benediction, we have a tradition here. We ask a speaker to come that we invite any students that would like to come down and pray for the ministry of our speaker can do so. So if any of you that want to come down, we'll need three volunteers to actually pray when we get down here. But you can come down. And Elder Skeet, if you will come to the center here so the students can gather around you and offer a special prayer. And then if you would have the benediction following. Thank you. Right, we like to, if we can connect by laying hands on Elder Skeet or the person in front of you can't reach. So have volunteers that would like to pray. Okay, we got one, two, and three. So we'll end with Natalia. Lorianne, you'll be second, and we'll start here. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, we'd just like to stand here and thank you for sending your messenger here to be a May, to talk to us, to preach to us, to let us learn more about you. Thank you for putting your words in his mouth. I ask that you'll continue to be with him wherever he may go, that he may be able to win more lives to Christ. Um, please be with him through and through and help him to teach others about you. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. Amen. Mighty Father in heaven, what a blessing your Sabbath day has been. Thank you so much for bringing Elder Randy Skeet here to speak to us young people. Thank you so much for helping him open our eyes to the high standards and the high callings that you've set for us. We pray, O oh Lord, today that you bless his ministry. Bless him as he continues to be a vessel, an instrument for you. Help him to continue to humbly accept the words and messages you give him and to go be a light to many others. We pray that you be with his family and his personal life as well. Help him to continue through your Holy Spirit that works in him to be an inspiration wherever he goes. Thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for hearing our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Dear Lord, as we all have our hands on Elder Randy Ski, I ask that you be with him, be with his ministry. And Lord, thank you for this holy Sabbath that you have hallowed, Lord. I ask that um, all the words that you have spoken through him, that we are able to apply it to our everyday lives and not remember it just today, but for our every day in the future and for when you come, Lord. I ask that you be with uh, Elder Randy Ski as he goes on to other places, Lord, to always have your word in his mouth, Lord, so that he can keep touching others like he has touched us. In your heavenly name I pray, amen. amen. Father, we thank you again for the Sabbath we have, for the opportunity to hear the words, Lord, but words are just words if we don't take them into our hearts and put them into action, Lord. And we just pray that what's been shared with us today, the word of Lord, the Lord, the word of God, the Bible, that we take it into our life. We also pray for Elder Skeet and his family. You know that the devil's not happy when someone preaches the word of God. So we pray for protection for him spiritually and physically and mentally and, and his ministries as he uh, reaches out to people around the world. Thank you for your blessings being with us today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. When do I pray? Maybe now. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of the word. We thank you for the enlightenment and conviction of your spirit. I personally thank you for the prayers of my young brothers and sisters. I'm deeply touched. And I ask you to bless them, their Father, in every possible way, particularly spiritually. Let none of them be lost when you come. Father, bless all those who heard your word today. And prepare our hearts for the Q&A this afternoon, I ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for the praise. I really, really felt touched. God bless you.